Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the third series in our What You Need to Know About Trade Secrets um, webinar series. This one's focused on defense. Um, uh, my name is Megan Madrid. I'm a partner in our Houston office in our labor and employment group, and I'll be presenting today with Brian Riapel, who is a partner in our Richmond office in our IP um, litigation patents department. And before we jump into the substance mat of, of today's webinar, I do just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, the first is that you'll see there's a Q&A widget on your screen, which you can use to submit questions to us um, in real time during the presentation. We will try to get to as many of these as we can during the presentation today, um, but we will pull all questions and we'll follow up um, with any questions that we're not able to answer um, in real time during the presentation today. Everything will be recorded and will be sent out to the attendees if you so choose um, to receive the materials. And we are also applying for CLE credit um, on your behalf as well. So with that, again, want to thank you so much for joining us today and we will jump right in. So the first topic that we're going to cover, we're going to cover a couple of different topics um, as it relates to defense of um, defense of trade secrets. And this one is one that we wanted to sneak in to make sure it was addressed um, as it wasn't covered in the, the prior two topics, but the protection of trade secrets during an M&A transaction. And so um, just high level, of course, always when you're dealing with a transaction, there's going to be diligence on you know, trade secrets that the um, target um, has, what's the value of those trade secrets, you know, whether there's been litigation over them, how they've been protected, um, have you know have they been sued over that? Have they had to sue over um, you know protecting them? And so that is always a subject of litigation, and certainly depending on how important the trade secrets are to the business, could be a very key part of the due diligence process. Just a few things to remember, and this is really more from a protection standpoint, but that the actual trade secret should not be disclosed on the disclosure schedules um, in terms of any particular detail. Um, obviously, if you're putting that on those disclosure schedules, it could potentially lose the, the protection. Um, in terms of actually uploading them into the data room, you want to make sure that there are, are proper protections in place in terms of, you know, what type of data room are you using, who has access to that. Um, very frequently now um, in, in deals, you know, there might be two separate data rooms, one for the very, very, you know, proprietary confidential information where access is not, you know, entire deal teams don't have access to those documents. I mean, it is very limited, and so you want to make sure that with respect to the trade secrets that are you know, being diligent in a deal, that adequate protections and safeguards are put in place in terms of you know, how you're giving access to those to buyer's counsel, buyer and buyer's counsel for review. And it, one thing, too, to consider is that if the trade secrets, again, is a very key component of the deal, um, consider engaging a third party to review the trade secrets um, from both a you know, protection and a defense standpoint. Um, also consider whether you need to separately deal with the transfer of those trade secrets and an ancillary document to the purchase agreement, um, such as a transition services agreement. And then... Um, certainly make sure that the letter of intent um, and if there are separate NDAs that are being signed um, are very um, ironclad in ensuring that there is protection for any trade secrets that are going to be disclosed in the deal process, um, whether the deal happens or not, that there's adequate you know, safeguards and protections for that information going forward. Um, so with that covered, let's now jump into you know, the true substance of today's webinar, which is defense of you know, trade secret claims. And we're going to talk about, um, first we're going to talk about just kind of hiring considerations and you know, pre-litigation concepts around defense of you know a trade secret claim or potential trade secret claims and then brian um, is going to handle you know okay so you get sued now now what do you do and take you through the mechanics of a trade secret lawsuit on the defense side so 
When it comes to you know hiring employees, um, there are certain considerations that an employer should always take in mind, um, regardless of what level the employee is. But certainly, obviously, the higher up the the chain, um, you know, from management to executive, the more important it is to make sure you're definitely you know making sure that these considerations are thought about before you make a new hire. So the first is um, to to always you know ask the employer or well the potential hire what agreement do they have um, do they have you know any type of written agreement with their employer that they either signed at the start of their employment or or you know have they been presented some type of severance agreement that might have you know restrictive covenants in them it's important to to know that information before you hire someone. Um, is it you know do they just have baseline confidentiality, non disclosure obligations to their you know prior employer or current what is then current employer? Do they have a non compete? Do they have non solicitation of customer or employees, or do they not have an agreement at all? And and the reason why I know you know obviously the the purpose of Today's webinar is about trade secrets, but there is definitely in the employment context uh, an intertwinement between restrictive covenants and trade secrets. And you know, so often I see from a litigation perspective is that you know the case started off about a restrictive covenant, a non-compete or a non-solicitation covenant, and you know that was what the prior employer you know had potential evidence of a violation. They tack on the trade secret claim, and then the trade secret claim somewhat morphs over and takes over the case. And so, it is important to see, you know, what what contractual obligations an employee, a potential employee, has, and how does that affect your potential hiring decision? Um, you know, even if they don't have those restrictive covenants, you also have to look at there are various other considerations, you know, to be thinking about to assess the potential, you know, is this potential hire going to potentially expose us to litigation? And some of those considerations are, you know, will the employee's position be the same or similar? Is it a position, you know, a sales position, an executive level position? Um, those are positions, obviously, that you often see prior employers more willing to litigate over because of the concern of the use of, you know, what they consider to be their trade secrets, whether it's customer lists or pricing information um, or other information, you know, strategic plans, information that's more at an executive or sales level that they would have had access to. And so that's a consideration to be thinking about. Also, you know, how how competitive are the two businesses? Um, has the, you know, have you, as a hiring entity, previously hired employees from this company? I mean, is this hire number one or is it hire number 10? Um, the more employees that you take from a, you know, a competitor, particularly in a, a relatively short time period, the, it, you know, that obviously increases the chances of potential litigation. Uh, even if there's not, you know, a claim in that jurisdiction for employee rating, which in a lot of jurisdictions there's not, um, there, there's still, you know, the more employees you take, the more that the, you know, the prior employer starts to feel like there could be bad blood or a potential claim, and, or maybe they just want to be aggressive and file suit to, to stop the bleeding of their employees going to the new organization. And um, the other thing to, to look at is, you know, what, what, type of litigation appetite does the employer prior employee have? Are they a pretty litigious employer that is, you know, regularly suing employees who leave to go to a competitor for trade secret theft? Um, is that just their, you know, their MO in terms of how they handle departing executives or departing sales employees or employees in a certain position? Does that potentially expose you to, to claims? Those are all um, considerations to be thinking about when you're in the, the recruitment process of a potential hire um, to potentially assess whether there is a potential likelihood for, for litigation to ensue. The other thing to think about is, you know, what type of, you know, quote unquote trade secrets could the employee, you know, potentially be accused of bringing with him? What information did, you know, 
and, not, and this is not for you to be asking, and I'll cover this in my next slide, it's not to be asking the employee these questions, but knowing an employee in this type of position, what type of information would you expect them to have access to at their prior employer? Um, and you know how important do you think that information is to the employer's business? Again, thinking about all these other factors that we've talked about um, to understand whether or not this, you know, what is the risk profile of this, you know, new hire? And then you know the other thing to think about: just are there other special considerations? For example, I mean, is this maybe it's not competitors, but is it a you know a customer vendor type relationship between the two entities? Um, such that there could, you know, potentially be some type of, you know, contractual obligations around not hiring this individual or this individual, you know, in one capacity was working on this information and now, you know, you're hiring them over and there's a risk that they could, you know, use that information for your benefit. Um, that's something to consider. The other, um, and I, I threw this in here because this is starting to, to become, I think, something that we're seeing more regularly in trade secret cases is social media accounts and who owns those social media accounts and how social media accounts are used. Um, obviously, um, you know, some businesses are starting to have, or some employers are starting to have dedicated social media accounts that they own, that they have the ownership rights over um, for certain employees in certain positions. And therefore, when that employee leaves, you know, they get to retain, you know, access to that account, all the information on that account stays theirs. And so, um, you know, if the employee were to come over and still try to use that account or retain any of the contacts from that account, um, could that potentially expose you to a, you know, a trade secret claim? The idea that the, the LinkedIn list, for example, is that a trade secret? And, and these are some of these are novel ideas that are, you know, obviously being argued by counsel, not necessarily resolved yet by the court. Um, but social media and, and the accounts that you have, um, not necessarily the posts, obviously, because that's public, but it's, you know, who your LinkedIn connections are and your your accounts and that information that you see that is behind the scenes on LinkedIn uh, could potentially be argued as, as a trade secret. And so figuring out who owns that information um, and whether that social media account belongs to that potential hire. So... You've kind of thought about all the potential hiring considerations, and you're, you decide, you know, this is someone that you want to keep moving forward in the recruitment process. There are definitely some do's and don'ts that if litigation were to ensue, the fact that you follow these do's and these don'ts could put you at least in a very good starting position from a defense perspective that you took necessary steps as the employer to ensure that this new hire wasn't bringing information with them from the prior employer and that they weren't going to be using it and that you certainly weren't you know, knowingly involved in any type of trade secret theft. Um, so the first is you want to ensure the employee understands his prior employer has trade secret rights. I mean, so many, you know, and obviously it can depend on the level of the employee, but there are just, you know, so many, you know, employees who might not realize certain information should be protected. Maybe it doesn't rise to the level of a trade secret. Obviously, that's always um, litigated in these cases, but there, you know, are certain Information that might be, you know, considered confidential, proprietary, it could be protected by a contractual obligation, and that employees oftentimes might just think that because, you know, they, they drafted that presentation, or they put together that customer list, or they worked on that document, that somehow they have some type of ownership right, or at least the right to keep it and keep a copy. And so I think making sure that that is, is explained to, you know, the recruit that, no, I mean, if it's the prior employer's information um, that they don't have a right to it, it's something important to make sure they understand because so often that misconception leads employees to take take things that maybe it's not a trade secret, but the taking of it is what's going to potentially lead to litigation um, by the prior employer when they see that, you know, a whole host of information was taken, maybe some of it will rise to the level of a trade secret, but the taking of it becomes a concern. 
You also want to ensure, um, you know, in that same vein, that the employee doesn't retain any trade secrets of a third party when joining the company. So again, it's making sure they understand what can be considered confidential, proprietary, or even a trade secret of their current employer or their prior employer, or even third parties that they might have worked with, customers or vendors, and then making sure that they understand they're not supposed to be bringing that information with them if they were to come work for you. You also want to make sure it's not just a matter of not taking a hard copy of that information, but that they shouldn't be retaining information on electronic storage devices. Um, you know, if if they have personal information that they're concerned about um, that they need, um, obviously the employee should be working with the prior employer in a process to make sure they, they get that information before they, they leave because it's, you know, Oftentimes, you have employees that are planning to leave and they are inserting electronic storage devices into their computer to take their personal information that they've stored, maybe family photos, mortgage documents, what have you, and they, you know, they want copies of it. Um, but they're, you know, they're plugging in these devices and it leads to the, the concern by the prior employer that other information has been taken. And so it's so much better for the employee to understand that there are traces of that um, and that if, if their desire is to, to get their private information that they stored on their work computer, that they're upfront with their prior employer and they, they work out a way to make sure they, they get that information with them and there's full transparency between the parties. You also want to advise the, the employer, the potential hire, of the expectation that they comply with their confidentiality requirements, whether they be contractual or even if they don't have any type of contractual non-disclosure obligation to their um, current employer, that they understand that there's, regardless, they're, they should should not um, be, again, bringing that information of the employer with them and that they have an obligation to keep that information confidential. You also want to make sure you advise the employee that you don't want any information or files of the prior employer. Um, to me, this is very important. I mean, to make and and again, I mean, obviously, you want to gauge the type of hire, but I mean, certainly, if you're dealing with the the types of positions where the 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 prior employer might be more likely to to sue over trade secret theft, your sales related positions, your executive level positions, that those individuals that you're very clear during the recruitment process that under no circumstances do you want that information or any files of the prior employer. Um, you don't on that same vein, you don't want to ask them to bring any documents of the prior employer. You don't want to ask them questions that even potentially, you know, could be viewed as you trying to get, you know, the trade secret information of the employer. For example, you know, asking about the, you know, financials of the of the current employer or asking about, you know, revenue of certain customers or what customers could you, you know, bring over and who are those contacts? Or, um, you know, asking about, oh, this is your team, what's their, you know, what's their salary and benefits look like? You don't want to be asking any of that information, um, even, you know, even if it's not in writing, if you're verbally asking it, you, that those are off-limit questions that you should not be getting into and should not be asking in terms of prying into, you know, even if it might not rise, you can make the argument it doesn't rise to the level of a trade secret. The fact that you are asking those questions certainly could be used against you in later litigation. And then you also do not um, accept any information or files of the prior employer from the employee. There, you know, obviously are occasions where the 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 applicant or you know you hire the employee and they say I have X Y Z that I you know have with me from my prior employer. Maybe the taking was intentional. Maybe they then inadvertently realize they took it and they offer it to the new employer. And that needs to be very emphatic with a no. We don't want that information. Um, that is is very very important to to be clear that even if they took it you do not want it um, and do not accept it under any circumstances. The next is you know put it in writing and this is something um, 
this is just a snippet of information of, of, of language that I'll often suggest in an offer letter or an employment agreement um, to provide to once you're going to extend the offer of employment to the individual to make it very clear what the expectations are in terms of them coming on board with you in terms of protecting the prior employer's information and files and, and not using them in any way. And so um, again, you'll get these slides, so you'll see that information. But the idea is to make it clear um, if you have an offer letter process, to put it in the offer letter. If you're going to have an employment agreement, to put it in the employment agreement. But if there is some type of written new hire document that you're providing to the employee, um, that you put that in for you know these disclosures in there. And if you're the type of company that you don't have offer letters, you don't have employment agreements. If you have an employee handbook, you can put you know, a policy that addresses this. And then, of course, your employee signs, um, you know, upon new hire, the handbook acknowledgement. And so you'd have that acknowledgement there. But it's just very important to have it somewhere in writing that it's very clear that, you know, the expectation that the employee comply with their contractual obligations, that they not bring any files or documents of the prior employer, that they not use any such information or disclose it. Um, and you'll see, you know, in my language, like I'm not defining it as trade secrets or confidential or the proprietary information. It's it's broader than that. It's don't bring any anything of your prior employer to your your position with us. So the the next idea is what to do with a bad lever employee. Um, and so this is the situation of you, the employer, learned that the employee took what could be considered confidential information of the prior employer, and what do you do? And so, you know, some of the, the questions that you have to ask in this type of situation, and of course, it's going to depend on your risk profile as an organization. Um, I mean, the first thing, obviously, to think of is, do you have an obligation to preserve evidence? Um, and if there is an anticipation of litigation, then you do have an obligation to preserve evidence. Um, where that could have come in play is if you or the employee received some kind of reminder letter or a cease and desist letter um, and you were copied on it. And so, you, you know, you've been put on notice that there is the potential for litigation over the hire of this employee or their potential taking of information that at that point you have an obligation to preserve evidence and it would you would not want to in this situation just tell the employee to delete it um, and then you delete it from your network and then you know it's gone the evidence the evidence of it being there is gone i mean at that point you have an obligation to preserve it and it, you know and if the employer the, the prior employer has already sent some type of letter the the most risk adverse way to handle that situation would be to advise the new employer of the fact that this information was taken and to provide, you know, a mechanism to ensure that it's returned and with their, you know, their consent, it's deleted from your, your systems, from your networks, wherever it's been stored. Obviously, before you would do something like that, you would need to understand, you know, how has this information been used, if at all, or disseminated within the company? Did you, you know, win some type of bid based solely on this information? I mean, is there a potential for damages because of the, you know, the potential use of this information? I mean, you certainly would need to do your due diligence before you reach out to the prior employer to understand, you know, what potential Pandora's box are you opening? Um, but nevertheless, I mean, if it's information that has um, you know, been taken, you have a, you have the, the notice that, you know, litigation is, is potentially likely. Um, the most, you know, at that point, like I said, the most risk averse would be to notify the prior employer. The other options, other options that you can consider in that case is, you know, preserving it, but segregating it such that no one within the organization has access to that information um, and can't use it any further, but obviously you're preserving it if and when you should, you know, be sued from a litigation perspective. 
Um, the other scenario would be, you know, maybe it's very early on, you no cease and desist letter, no, no notice that there's potential, you know, a potential for litigation. Now, what do you do? I mean, at that point, um, uh, again, most risk averse would be to notify the prior employer. Um, if you're you have a higher risk tolerance and, and you're sure, you know, that there's really, you know, not any potential for litigation, you could potentially consider, you know, having the information forensically removed. Is there a way to work with your forensic vendor to preserve any potential evidence, but also take all necessary steps to get that information deleted from your system? Um, and then the last question is, do you discipline the employee, and how do you how do you deal with the employee who took the information? Obviously, that's going to depend on what information they took. Did they use it? I mean, there's certainly a sliding scale here between someone who, you know, inadvertently takes something and and maybe uploads it because they were, you know, it was grouped together with all kinds of other personal information that they wanted saved on, you know, a folder on their computer with someone kind of who intentionally takes, you know, the most important information of their prior employer and is starting to use it for their new employer. You know, someone who's that type of bad lever, I mean, certainly the discipline could be something at, such as termination, whereas the person who inadvertently takes it, it's a you know another reminder, another similar to that language on the last slide, having them sign something where going forward they reaffirm that they are not going to use any you know any other information of the prior employer, um, that they don't have any other information. So again, you have to look at the situation in terms of how you would deal with the employee. And then the next topic is so. You've hired someone, you did your due diligence, and now you've gotten a cease and desist letter from the prior employer. And maybe you got your own cease and desist letter as the new employer, or you were copied on the cease and desist letter to the, the, the employee that you just hired. What should you do now that you've received the cease and desist letter? You should definitely investigate, you know, before responding. If there are new allegations in there, for example, now an agreement has come to light that when you ask the employee about it um, during the recruitment process, the employee said didn't exist. Now you have a copy of it. You're going to have to get into the details of that to see whether or not is there any risk in continuing to employ this individual now that you know that they do have an employment agreement. Uh, because once you have knowledge of that agreement, in many jurisdictions, there's the potential for what's called a tortious interference claim against you as the employer for hiring that individual in violation of their agreement. So that's definitely something you would have to assess. If there are allegations about certain you know, information being taken, maybe they put in, you know, this letter talks about certain, you know, thumb drives or electronic storage devices being used, you're, you're going to need to talk to the employee at that point to understand the, the details as to, well, did you take these? Did you plug them in? Why? What type of information? Have those been plugged into our computers? Um, you know, what information was uploaded, you certainly want to, before, you know, firing off a response to a letter like this, make sure you know the facts and know, you know, what has been done on your side by by the employee um, and by any other employees within the organization as it relates to the allegations made in the letter. And so once you, you know, know your facts, then you want to draft the appropriate response. Um, I like to recommend not being too adversarial. I mean, the more adversarial you are, are I mean, it, again, I guess it depends on what your goal is. I mean, if you want to litigate the issue, then certainly being having an adversarial tone will help move that ball towards litigation. But if the goal is to diffuse the situation and to potentially bring about a resolution pre-suit, um, then you want to try to to avoid being adversarial, to avoid you know getting into too many legal arguments, um, and really just try to provide assurances as to you know that that you recognize the importance of protecting trade secrets, and that this is what you did to ensure that you know the trade secret information of the employer was not being brought over um, to you know engage and suggest that the parties engage in an open dialogue to ensure that no information has, you know, inadvertently been been brought over or taken. Um, but you want to assume that that letter is going to be used potentially in, in litigation going forward. So you want to have the appropriate tone. 
And then the other point that I have is having the appropriate person author that. So if, if it's a letter from their in-house counsel, it might make sense to have, if you have in-house counsel, to have your in-house counsel respond. It doesn't mean you can have your counsel, outside counsel, draft it for you, but the letter coming from, you know, the same type of party who sent the letter um, is something to consider. And then once you receive that cease and desist letter, you then need to take appropriate steps to avoid the spoliation claim, to put in the, um, you know, the doc, to put in the protocols to ensure that, you know, data is being preserved, that data preservation notices are sent to the right custodians, that you're preserving both things electronically and on hard copies. Um, you know, there's, and, and so often people, you know, employers are, are, are good about making sure that, you know, emails are preserved, but there are definitely other things in these cases that need to be preserved as well, such as, you know, and things that get overwritten on a, on a very frequent basis, things like computer logs and access logs and other things that you would want to work with your ID, IT department to identify um, as, you know, logs kept on the computer systems related to, you know, access and storing of information to make sure that those are being preserved and not overwritten. And then lastly, consider whether there are any pre-litigation settlement options um, that the parties could engage in. Maybe there's some type of pre-litigation forensic protocol that can be agreed to to ensure if there is any information taken that it is um, there's a mechanism to have it deleted both from the employee's devices the employers' networks. Um, if, if there is, you know, obviously the earlier in the hiring of the employee and their departure from the prior employer, that's your best chance to mitigate potential damages and try to resolve the issue because the longer it goes on, obviously the harder it's going to become. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian to talk about um, once the lawsuit has happened, what to do. Thanks, Megan. And again, just to introduce myself, I'm <clears throat> Brian Riappel. I'm a, a partner here in the Richmond office at McGuire Woods and former chair of the uh, IP litigation department. Um, so as Megan said, I'm going to be talking about what's what happens now after you've been sued. Uh, one thing I'm not going to talk about is I'm not going to start talking about like the entire length of a trade secret case. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about specific defenses uh, that could be raised during a trade secret defense. Frankly, most of that was covered on the flip side by Rod Satterwhite and Darren Collins in the first one of these. And so, anybody that's <clears throat> listening and is, has been a, a, a faithful attendant to these three, um, I don't want to waste their time. But I'm going to focus instead on is what are the like five immediate steps that need to be done when you get sued for uh, trade secret uh, misappropriation? So let me start there. <clears throat> and the first thing uh, I definitely would advise doing is retaining outside counsel immediately. Um, and that's easy for me to say since I'm the outside counsel. But um, what I mean by this is a lot of cases, especially a lot of civil cases, company receives a complaint and the in, uh, general counsel of the company, understandably and responsibly so, wants to put it out for an RFP, wants to see what the kind of, you know, what the various uh, firm's strategies may be, what kind of uh, financial uh, arrangement they can come to. Um, and that is all, in a normal civil case, that is all <clears throat> very responsible and, and the, the right thing to do. In a trade secret case, my experience is they tend to move much faster in the very beginning of a case, and things need to be done much quicker. Um, and it is necessary to get outside counsel on board as quickly as possible and especially somebody, an uh, outside counsel, who is experienced in handling a uh, trade secret case, either a, uh, a, a trade secret case under the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, uh, <clears throat> which is incorporated in most of the states across the country, or the Defend Trade Secrets Act uh, under the federal law. Um, <clears throat> so 
as I said, the initial steps will move much faster. I'm going to cover some of those steps. Um, and, you know, immediate action is going to need to be taken um, on some of these steps. So let me move to the next one. The first thing that we always strongly advise our clients on this is you need to retain an outside computer forensic expert. You need to retain an expert to get you, help you get a handle on the computer forensic evidence as soon as possible. Now, I know that a lot of <clears throat> companies are going to say, you know, we don't need to go outside to do this. We, you know, we have in, inside IT support um, and th they can handle this for us. What, you know, just tell us what you need to do. Um, there are two reasons why I would say you should, that, that's, that's great but you need to go outside. Uh, the first one is that this, out, this computer forensic uh, expert is very likely to be uh, a, a, a witness at trial. And you want somebody who is not related to the company, um, who is a third party, uh, is neutral, and can give credence to any positions you need to be taking. If you use somebody on the inside, uh, they will be attacked for bias. Um, and it may hurt uh, the credibility of your defense uh, if and when you go to trial. Uh, the second reason I would say is, while there's no question that I'm sure most of you have uh, extremely uh, competent internal IT people, uh, having worked with numerous uh, third-party computer forensic uh, people, it is frankly amazing what they can do, and they are experienced in doing this, and they do it all the time. And they know what to look for. They know under which rocks to look. Uh, they know how to, <clears throat> to log this, to document it, and to frankly help your defense. And so that's one of the reasons why you should always go outside, I believe, to get a uh, computer forensic evidence. Why do you want to have somebody who's doing computer uh, uh, forensic uh, research and looking at the evidence for you? Well, I've got about five reasons I've listed here. Uh, the first one is, and I this obviously comes from my point of view of being a, a trial lawyer and know, getting the story together, but it helps build your case narrative. The, the computer forensic expert will be able to look at uh, evidence and track where uh, stuff has been sent, how it's come into the system, how it's been used, has it been viewed, has it been printed, um, and it will help you build the case narrative. So, you know, will this only is this a, a, an instance where this only came, this came with somebody you just hired, or was this was only sent to one of your employees and it was never uh, sent around the company, so you can try to narrow uh, the scope of the case, or was this something that was dis distributed widely, and then you need to figure out, okay, who's looked at this, who's used this? So this will help, help outside counsel and help you under, build the case narrative. It will also give you an opportunity to bolster your witness's credibility. So let's say the CEO of the company received this, the email that had the allegedly trade secret information in it. But their take is on it is that I never look at it. I just never looked at this. I could see that this wasn't something I was supposed to have. I never looked at it. The con uh, forensic analysis can back that up. It can show whether that person opened it, whether they viewed it, whether they copied it to something else, whether they printed it. And so if that, uh, during deposition, if your CEO is saying, I never looked at it, having done the analysis will help bolster them and give them the confidence to be able to testify in the not only the truthful way, but the way that best helps the case. Um, <clears throat> it can also be used to discredit other witnesses. Let's say this was a uh, somebody that got hired from 
uh, another company, and they realize, oh, they're in trouble. And so they want to say, well, they, it wasn't just them. They sent this to five, six other people. And um, <clears throat> they, the forensic analysis can determine whether they, in fact, sent it to five or six other people. Um, even if they sent it and then tried to delete the evidence they sent, these uh, forensic analysts can figure that out. And so it can help discredit somebody who's trying to make you, your employees, uh, and your company look bad. Also, really avoids surprise evidence. The last thing you want to do, especially as in-house counsel, is have a CEO or uh, a CFO uh, get in there in deposition and say, you know, no, this was never sent around, this was never uh, looked at, <clears throat> and then the other side produces uh, data, metadata, that shows, well, in fact, it was sent to uh, three of the salespeople, or worse yet, it was sent to the research and development department. Um, and so you want this, by figuring out the forensic analysis, it will help you avoid surprise evidence so that the decision makers in the company are not surprised. The last thing, or the last thing I've listed here that will help do, is it may uncover spoliation. Megan uh, touched upon this. I can tell you that in my uh, experience doing uh, trade secret uh, cases, for some reason, spoliation tends to rear its ugly head in trade secret cases much more than it does in other kinds of cases. Um, we at McGuire Woods handled a case uh, several years ago where we were uh, the plaint uh, plaintiff's counsel and uh, after the doing the forensic analysis on both not only our stuff but on the other side, uh, it became evident that once the complaint had been served and the other side became, uh, employees at the other side became cognizant of it, there was a uh, massive uh, deletion of, of uh, electronic documents to try to uh, prevent it looking like the documents have been spread around the company. Um, and so doing this will, can help it, but also if you're the defendant, help you figure out if somebody has either intentionally or inadvertently destroyed documents because, and I'll touch on this in a couple minutes, but spoliation can throw a whole new wrinkle into a trade secret defense. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, uh, a step after you started doing the forensic analysis, uh, and Megan touched upon this also, but you need to preserve evidence. And in fact, what you should try to do is sequester the alleged uh, trade secret or confidential or just sequester the electronic and document information that came into the company that's being accused and remove it, make it inaccessible to everyone else. Um, I can't tell you how important this is and uh, has proved useful in previous cases. In fact, um, I was involved in a case within the last 12 months between uh, two major companies in this country in which uh, the plaintiff um, not only was, was suing for trade secret misappropriation, but they uh, were seeking a preliminary injunction. And part of the relief they were seeking was to prevent the defendant from participating or bidding on specific uh, jobs that may or may not have been touched by this uh, alleged information. By And, and the client was uh, extremely responsible in this case. And by working with them, you'd be able to sequester the evidence by making it inaccessible to anybody except general counsel or in-house counsel's office at the client. Um, it took the real sting, and the judge gave a very a very clear indication 
that they were not going to grant a uh, preliminary injunction, and it led to the eventual early settlement of the case. Um, but it is another reason why you want to sequester that evidence. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about the evidence preservation, and the forensic analysts will do this, is check on the transfer of evidence. How has evidence been transferred? Not only from person to person, but from device to device. Um, has it come in on a thumb drive? Uh, was it sent in coming off of, uh, like, out of the cloud on Dropbox? Many different ways, but it will help you limit um, the, what eventually be the scope of the discovery. And so you're saying, they say, oh, we want to take the, uh, you know, the deposition of the CEO here. So wait a minute, there is no evidence in this case. The CEO ever saw this information, ever received this information, ever knew about this information. And that will help prevent uh, the spreading of this and limit the size of the case. Um, <clears throat> now, you, on here again, I've touched on spoliation. By preserving the evidence, uh, it helps avoid spoliation issues. Now, those of you who've been involved in litigation, you know one of the first things that uh, you do uh, and, and outside counsel should instruct you to do is when you receive a complaint, you send out a litigation hold notice. Um, <clears throat> so that helps, but this is also making sure that no evidence that came in uh, gets uh, destroyed. Um, spoliation has really bad effects, not only in all litigation, but especially in a trade secret litigation. Um, the judge I will promise you, if they learn of spoliation early on in the case, even before outside counsel got involved, they will develop an early bias against the client and things will not go well. It will be an even steeper uphill climb. Um, and one of the uh, issues that could happen is that there could be an adverse jury instruction. Um, the case that I was discussing earlier about the other side destroying documents after we had served the complaint on them. Uh, we were able in that case, after <clears throat> a evidentiary hearing on spoliation, uh, able to uh, obtain an adverse jury instruction uh, informing the jury that the uh, defendants had uh, committed uh, spoliation. And uh, I probably don't need to say this, but we certainly uh, Pounded that in opening and closing arguments. Um, the next thing, one of the things that needs to be need to prepare for is uh, an early injunction motion. Um, injunction motions, the Defense for Trade Secrets Act and the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, both statutorily provide for uh, injunctions. Of course, if you're in federal court, you can move for an injunction anyway. Um, they are very common in trade secret cases. Um, they are, I will say, a high-risk, high-reward endeavor. Um, <clears throat> plaintiff certainly has to have their uh, ducks in a line uh, before they file suit so they can hit hard and quick on an, an injunction. Um, if they plaintiff prevails, on the uh, preliminary injunction, it will often end the case. Uh, it will it cause such problems with uh, defend, defendant's business that uh, they need to do something to resolve it. There's no point. Um, but it's also a high risk because if the plaintiff gets in there and isn't able to obtain a preliminary injunction, it now starts to shift the momentum, momentum and may start to shift uh, the way the court is thinking uh, about the case. Um, as I was just uh, talking, it is an early, it provides an early advantage for plaintiff. Uh, plaintiff moving on a trade secret case uh, will most likely have done most of the work on this, figured out what's going on, and if they hit quickly, if there's not a lot of going back and forth on cease and desist letters beforehand, and not a lot of that, but they just come flying out of the, uh, of the gate, um, often defendants can't react fast enough. And the courts, if the plaintiff can come in and make the uh, 
prima facie case and, and, and show the four elements necessary for plenary injunction, the defendants just you may not be able to react fast enough. And so it's one of the things that defense counsel and the client need to be getting ready for the minute a trade secret misappropriation complaint comes in. Um, I will say, and this goes back to the high risk, high reward aspect of it, uh, it does, if the plaintiff loses, it does hurt their credibility. And so that is a uh, something to uh, uh, be considered, both from the plaintiff's point of view, but also from the defendant's point of view, because frankly, you, you, as a defendant in a trade secret case, you start off on the back foot, and if you can switch to the front foot and hurt the plaintiff's credibility, then that's obviously what you want to do. Um, the last thing I want to talk about that needs to be done immediately or extremely early in the case is a defendant needs to press for the definition of the trade secrets early. Um, in a plaintiffs do not put their trade secrets in their complaints because most complaints are public documents and obviously if you put your trade secrets in there you are waiving the uh, secrecy of it so they will not they will not define them there it usually is gets defined uh, some courts will require them to define them uh, shortly after filing the complaint most often though it happens in the first round of discovery but I will tell you this the battle over defining trade secrets will be a continuing battle throughout the litigation. Plaintiffs tend to want to define their trade secrets broadly, tend to want to uh, give them more flexibility after they've been, so they can see what happens through the discovery and see what's been taken so they can redefine to focus the case. Um, and it gives them more, uh, a lot of time plaintiffs just want to go into a, a jury trial and uh, make the jury think that these are bad guys because they stole this stuff and not focus so much on the specifics of the trade secrets themselves and so they try to keep it vague. Defendants on the other hand want to know exactly what the trade secrets are. What are you accusing me of taking? They want to be able to show, uh, oh, if you're defining that's your trade secret, that's not a trade secret, that's not a secret or we never received that, or that has no value in this industry, that can't be of any uh, value. Um, and so this can't be a trade secret case. Um, they also want to do it because it will help limit the discovery um, and limit the number of employees or systems that the plaintiff will want to delve into. Um, from a defendant's point of view, the initial interrogatory should demand a listing of the trade secrets. Um, I promise you that the response coming back uh, will probably not be uh, very defined. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it will be broad things like customer list or marketing ideas or, you know, the way to make this product. Um, it is defendants, you really need to press the plaintiff as going as far as, you know, move to compel, say it's necessary. The case law in this country is uh, split. Most jurisdictions require that a plaintiff to find their trade secrets. Um, it's, some, it's stronger in some jurisdictions than in others, but I will tell you that my experience is that it really tends to be a judge to judge um, issue. Uh, I was involved in a trade secret case uh, a little over a year ago in which we thought in the jurisdiction we were in there was very strong case law for defining the uh, trade secrets. We were representing a defendant. Um, the judge uh, thought their definition of the trade secrets was fine and it was extremely vague. Um, which makes it difficult to get ready for the case. But it does lead to a strategy call. It leads to a strategy call for defendants. Once they get, they've pushed a little, they want to keep pushing because it is, 
is it better to get the defined trade secret so they know exactly what they're fighting against, or is it easier to defend against vague identification? Because if the identification is vague, then it may be easier to show that this is public information. Uh, it may be easier to knock out a summary judgment. Um, if this is technical information, it may be easier to show that um, uh, this is available in patents somewhere. Um, I, we have had, we at McGuire Woods have had that type of case in the past where uh, there were patents on the technology for which we were uh, accusing the defendants of stealing the, the uh, trade secret information. Uh, part of it had to do with the amount of how do you use spin process during the manufacturing of the product. Uh, the, the product. Um, the patents gave a very wide range of spinning. Defendants try to say you can't claim spinning as part of the trade secret. And we as plaintiffs had to say, no, no. What we're saying is that the patent says between 100 and 1,000, our trade secret is we figured out at the optimal spin rate is 700 rotations per minute. So it, again, it becomes a strategy call for whether the defendant wants to push or not push uh, and what's easier to defend to knock out maybe a summary judgment um, or otherwise. So those are the quick, uh, immediate things. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions afterwards, please feel free to contact us to uh, if there's something we didn't cover or if we didn't uh, answer any questions that you had during the uh, thing. And again, thank you for attending, and I hope everybody uh, has a great holiday season.